Studio Ghibli is a household name. Depending on your age, you might recognize different films as the definitive Ghibli experience. If you're around 30, then you might remember Spirited Away, which played on Cartoon Network very regularly. Let's go! And signed her life away to a crazy witch. And that's just the first 20 minutes. It is a new start in human. Tsunami is proud to present the Academy Award-winning film, Spirited Away. If you're older, you might have had a copy of My Neighbor Totoro on VHS. And if you're young, then you might feel more at home with the movie Ponyo, which was a hit at the local theater where I worked in 2008. No matter the specific film that fills your soul with nostalgia, if you're the type of person like me who keeps up with the work of anime studios, you've probably noticed that unfortunately, overall audience enjoyment of Ghibli films has degraded over the past decade, which is considered in no small part to be the result of the retirement of famed Ghibli artisan Hayao Miyazaki. You might have heard of him, or at the very least seen his name, where he was falsely alleged to have said anime was a mistake. To nail the coffin, Miyazaki's son Goro Miyazaki released his own film under the Ghibli name Earwig and the Witch in 2021. I'll be learning magic! Well, so I was told. Can't wait to start! The film has since famously received mixed to negative reviews and notoriously his father walked out of the film, stating that he felt like he had been in the theater for three hours, only an hour in. After just an hour, Miyazaki abruptly walks out. The son's film is brimming with scenes reminiscent of the father's movies. The veteran filmmaker, devoted to his work, was an absentee dad. Goro's exposure to his father growing up was mainly by watching his father's films. <laughs> This, of course, could have been for any number of reasons, but it hasn't stopped the internet from stirring the pot, alleging Mr. Miyazaki hated his son's film. The last Ghibli film I personally enjoyed was the 2014 When Marnie Was There. Promise me something that will remain a secret forever. but I have to agree with what seems to be general sentiment that Ghibli hasn't made a great film since 2004's Howl's Moving Castle. Journey to amazing new worlds. Find me in the future! Aboard Howl's Moving Castle. Personally, I was under the impression that Studio Ghibli was dead. A giant of the industry reduced to a lifeless husk paraded around for quick cash grabs. I would hazard a guess that you're of the same opinion. But Ghibli does have a spiritual successor. Though it's obviously not under the same name, many industry veteran creators from Ghibli are still making films right now in this new studio. In 2015, Yoshiaki Nishimura, one of Ghibli's lead film producers, founded Studio Panak, which quickly gained the support of several Ghibli animators. The studio made its first debut working on a 2015 advertisement campaign for the West Japan Railway Company. And in this extremely short 15 second advertisement, Panak captures the childish whimsy and fluid motion that Ghibli is known for. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good, 
If you are anywhere near familiar with Ghibli's style and the way that they design characters, then you can also be completely forgiven for just outright assuming that this is their work. Two years later, in 2017, Podock would release the first feature film Mary and the Witch's Flower based on the 1971 book The Little Broomstick by Mary Stewart. It became the sixth highest grossing film in Japan that year. It tells the story of a young girl named Mary Smith who finds a flower in a forest near her grandmother's home called a fly-by-night. The flower gives her the power to become a witch for one night and she's magically whisked away into the Hogwarts-esque Ender College for witches and wizards. It's extremely charming. I would dock points for being a very obvious ho Harry Yeah. I would dock points for being a very obvious Harry Potter ripoff, but honestly it doesn't feel too much that way at all. Probably because the little broomstick obviously predates the Harry Potter novels. Maybe JK Rowling ripped off Mary Stewart, I don't know. The animation and art are exceptional, while the general themes and writing really stick to the Ghibli spirit. It looks and feels so akin to a Ghibli film that Is Mary and the Witch's Flower a Ghibli movie is one of the top suggested searches on Google. If you have for some reason not seen it, then I'd highly recommend it, and I'm giving Mary and the Witch's Flower an 8 out of 10. Very good. A single year later, Ponock released a series of short films in a compilation called Modest Heroes. I'm a bigger fan of Modest Heroes than Mary and the Golden Shower Flower, though Mary is certainly a more complete product. My appreciation mainly stems from the decision to restrict these stories to a short film format. The restraint allowed for the pacing of each film to be perfect, and the short runtime allows for greater distributions of funding. This additional funding allows for great attention to detail in regards to the animation, lowering the overall dips in quality that a longer product would typically have. The first film is an adorable little thing called Canini and Canino. The film stars two anthropomorphized crab children who crab lose their crab father in a crab storm. The first time I watched this, I thought that they were just little river spirits or something. They even show some normal crab in one scene. But why are these little crabs people? Why, but those are just normal crabs. They never explain it. It drives me nuts. The children go on like an adventure and find their father, and the film spends most of its time developing the world of these little river people. There's very little spoken dialogue, and almost all of it is just made up words that vaguely sound like language. It's actually a pretty nice twist on a story that takes place in the Paleolithic period before intricate language was developed. When the kids find their father, he's fighting off the world's most terrifying CG fish. This thing is the thing of absolute nightmares. The use of computer graphics to make the fish look disturbing was an extremely good choice. The sound design helps sell it as well. They give the fish a roaring and growling sound to make it reminiscent of a bear or maybe a dragon. I'll probably watch this one every year, and I'm giving Canini and Canino a 9 out of 10. Great. It's hard to find much wrong with such a simple product executed so wonderfully. Anyone who can pull off such a nice, simple story should be commended for their artistic excellence. The next film in the compilation is Life Ain't Gonna Lose, a film about a child who is deathly allergic to eggs and his mother who dreams of being a professional dancer. The colors are beautiful pastels that fit well with the story about childhood and parenting. They also contrast greatly with the film that ends up being a story about a child going through several near-death experiences. Several times in the film, the young main character accidentally ingests eggs and has to be carried off by an ambulance to the hospital. Though short, the film delves into every aspect of a lifestyle so specific that the writers must have experienced it themselves. As with Canini and Canino, the animation on display is extremely fluid. Everything has these bright, thick lines that you would think would make the animation more stiff, but somehow it works just kind of the exact opposite. There's this one extremely stylized scene of the mother dancing that I think could have used a little bit more attention. The limbs kind of like become extremely noodly and off model, but an argument could be made that it was intentional, I guess. For a film about something as basic as food allergies, there are several short but strong scenes pulling at my heartstrings here. There are scenes in this film that I haven't stopped thinking about since I saw it. I've rewatched it three times now, and if you're the type of person that's had near-death experiences, you'll likely relate well with the film. The suspenseful mood never drops, and the threat of looming disaster is played completely straight. Several clips also work as interpretive pieces on the nature of life and death. I love coming-of-age stories like this, but I'm more than aware that it doesn't really hold up to the standards set by Mary in the Scary Terry or Splatoon Crab Edition. It appeals to me on a personal level, but Life Ain't Gonna Lose is a 7 out of 10. Good. 
The final short is a film called Invisible, about a man who is metaphorically unseen by those around him. This one feels the most like something that could have been left on the cutting room floor. Most of the film is mundane moments in very drab and dreary settings. Situations like buying things from a convenience store or a depressing moment at the office. Much of the film is up to interpretation, and while that's generally a good thing, it doesn't quite click with me on a personal level in the way Life Ain't Gonna Lose does. The dark, more gray, edgy colors are also a far cry from the previous two shorts' bright and colorful palettes. There are a lot of browns and darker hues used, with even the brightest of highlights being an off-white beige. After a few scenes, it's revealed that not only is the character invisible, but he also is air buoyant and carries a fire extinguisher to weigh himself down. Dropping that weight causes him to simply float away into the sky, which works as a nice climactic conflict. On a rewatch, I even noticed that some of the movements of the characters are a dead giveaway that he lacks mass, and it's nice to see that attention to detail just given in something like this. The film's main drawback is its reliance on tropes, though. Extremely common tropes. In one scene, someone calls out to the Invisible Man and then runs towards him to imply that they finally see him, but as I'm sure you've seen many times, the person just runs directly past him and into somebody else. If that's not the type of thing that would bother you, then you might like it better than I did. But personally, I can't say that. I'll be watching this again, maybe, to show Ponok's work to somebody else, and I give Invisible a 6 out of 10. Fine. The last animation we'll discuss in this video is Studio Ponok's most recent work, commissioned by the Tokyo Olympic Games. Tomorrow's Leaves is an 8 minute long film that can be found right here on YouTube. Though exceptionally well animated, it's not what someone would call a proper film, with characters and arcs. Tomorrow's Leaves is more of a short clip show meant to inspire the values that the Olympic Games were determined to instill in their competitors. Five children from uniquely independent backgrounds are chosen by some sort of spirit to save a nondescript island from a vague threat of deforestation. Most of what could be considered story is up to interpretation, and the video mostly works as a way to show off and get people in the mood for Olympic sports. Still, I recommend that you give it a watch if you have a free 10 minutes. As with all Ponox products so far, Tomorrow's Leaves is still enjoyable. It reminds me of some short animations on YouTube and isn't something I would really consider in need of a proper score or review, but this is I'll review anything, and this falls under anything. So I'll give Tomorrow's Leaves a 7 out of 10. Good. My hope is that seeing some of these clips might have given you a little bit of that hope back that you lost thinking that Ghibli was gone. Ponok's current film project is a film called The Imaginary, which is being directed by Yoshiyuki Momose, the mind behind Life Ain't Gonna Lose. I'm definitely going to be watching out for that one, and I hope to review it on the channel when it finally drops. It doesn't have a release date so far, but I'm certainly going to be keeping my ear to the ground for any news. Have you watched any of Studio Ponok's stuff? Which one was your favorite? Was it one of the shorts and Modest Heroes? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and subscribe and whatever, and I'll talk to you guys next time. Special thanks to our executive producers, Anthony Wumbo, James Novak, John Foreman, and Zachary Coroner.